feet. Balls of both feet. Now come back to center and go to the 45. Okay, because you will have this shifting with the sword. And then back to center. Just, you'll go on the balls of the feet and pivot. And both feet should be aimed that way, as if you took a stance towards that corner, if you did it properly. Now, when you shift to center, you're in a relaxed or a horse stance. And when you go to 45, you're as if you aim that way. Are you part of this class? OK. <clears throat> when I key eye, I want you to shift back to center, because I want to watch it. Then you're going to shift to that 45. <clears throat> So, hey, so, good, very good. Now, you, okay, back to center. Now you're gonna know the intent. Just, I think we have enough room. Let's take the first <coughs> arm and come uh, forward one step. And let's try your boat. You will see some people hold a sword. I believe there's a cover shot of of, of uh, a movie star right now, one of the magazines holding a sword, and he's like this. <coughs> and he has those fingers uh, pointing, like that. But that's fine, but I don't really uh, do that. I don't recommend that. That's just an over-exaggeration that you don't use the finger. In other words, I hold the sword and I have the, the finger in place. If you've been to my open hand seminar, just like the fist, we do not squeeze an entire fist. We let this open. This goes into a, the shape of a fist, but we let this open and you can hit harder than you can by squeezing the entire fist. Same thing true with the sword. You hold the sword, you do not squeeze with these two fingers on the sword. You squeeze with these three and you'll get the feeling. When I hold the sword, most of them are designed, and by the way, if you're interested in a real samurai sword, every now and then you can pick up a real good deal at some of these antique places along highways. I've had students stop in and buy swords for $25 to $100 that were worth <coughs> hundreds. However, that, that age is uh, like since gone, at least at the antique markets. I used to go over there and it was, it was, uh, I was picking up samurai swords at $25 a piece. And I was going back to my school and selling them for $100, $150 a piece. <laughs> and now I wish I'd have kept them all. Because I, may, I took my money up to $100, $150, but those same swords are worth uh, $700, 1000 2000 Now if you go over the uh, antique market, they know what swords are worth. There are books on them. They can tell you the year it was made, everything, right at the antique markets. And you can't touch a sword now for under 700 that's a bad one. Thousand, two thousand dollars, especially if it's an old one. So I'm just telling you that the, the, the age of the American not knowing about the samurai sword in the antique world is kind of over. And if I had all those swords that I bought for $25, sold for $100, i would have a lot of money today because I was selling them to the students to do the katas, etc. But a lot of uh, uh, real good swords were going into their hands that were signed and dated by the original maker, uh, etc. So, so sometimes I get a student every now and then, they'll be driving along, stop at some little antique place on an old road, and they have a samurai sword at a reasonable price. So that's why it's worth checking out if you found it somewhere, <coughs> especially out in the country. <coughs> Somebody brought one back from World War II, and he passed away, and his family just sells it, and they don't know what it's worth, and you can sometimes pick up a real good buy. If you're anywhere and see a real blade samurai sword, which we're going to show you what they look like, if you're anywhere and you see one, and it's that reasonable, <coughs> buy it. You're going to double your money, triple your money, quadruple your money. So. <coughs> this cut and this cut is what I've used most of my life. This hold on the <coughs> handle, the hands together, the hand spread. If you've been to my bow seminar, this becomes the guide hand. This pulls, this becomes the power hand for the blade. 
Separation gives you more guide, more power. You've seen this hold on swords, I'm sure, if you've seen pictures, yes? <coughs> okay, you also, you will see me doing this hold on swords, yes? And you'll see some people like that hand to hand. A lot of it is determined by the length of the shaft or the handle that you're holding. <coughs> But, this is considered a sport hold. This is considered a full combat hold. And I'll explain that a little bit later when I get into true cutting. But this is a sport hold. And this hold is used actually to kill or to make sure that the blade cuts on a sharp enough angle that it cuts and penetrates the target. Most of the moves you'll be doing today will involve you having the sword just at chest high with the hands, up above the head. Everybody try to get that position. And you're going to go to a cut in front of you, and I want it to stop when someone moves the sword to show that they have control of the weapon. They should stop like so, waist high. In other words, the sword shouldn't go beyond your strike. In other words, you should know that the strike is to there and it should stop there. It shouldn't like overlap or, or go on its own from that point. So you take the sword for, for the cut, get in a horse stance, <coughs> and hook, come back up. Now you're going to take the sword and slice on a 45. Okay, I want you to be very slow and careful. <coughs> I want you to just come over to this 45 corner and slice 45 back up to here and you're going to go to that corner and slice 45. Same motion and, and behind the bow, the object is to be slicing at the head and or cutting into this area or cutting into this area. The 45 degree angle area of the shoulder to the head to the neck is the most vulnerable area to strike because it does not allow for missing. Anywhere I would cut in here, I'm going to do damage. I'm going to interrupt his arm or shoulder. I'm going to cut into collarbone <clears throat> or muscles that control the arm and the shoulder. I'm going to cut the neck and kill my opponent. I'm going to injure head. I'm anywhere to death is going to happen in that area. So a lot of slicing to this 45 and foot move. And then naturally, they like to come dead to center and down to split the cantaloupe. <clears throat> so let's try just some motion with, I'm gonna have you step out of my foot and attack. Come back, go with the left foot and 45. Back, right foot 45. Back and hold. Ready? So. no one's in front of you or if you get hit with this, you can put just a little more power that you, you put the, the power of the stroke, but get a dead stop on the sword. Let's try it again. Okay. Straight down, straight down. Now 45. Now back, and the other way. Back. Ready? Right. Back. Right. Back, left, back. They favored right. You'll see most sword <coughs> cutters will favor right. If you've been in my pressure point seminar, you understand that a lot of the killing is done over on that side. Hard hand has influence to that side. A lot of sword movements will be to that side. When, <coughs> when the Japanese used the samurai sword 
it is said that they tried to parry with the back of the sword. To the block or the parry to stop a weapon, they tried to use the back end because any nick in the blade uh, would, would dull it, would, would nick it, and interfere with the cut or the kill. So they would try to, and when the sword cut it, you're going to learn today, there will be a motion like this with the sword. And you are just to, to cut. So you are to work a parry with this, and then you're going to try to get the sword in between him and the, uh, the blade for the cut for the kill. So they, they will use the back, and then they will cut, stab, or kill with, with the lead part of the top. When they strike, they naturally strike full power. You're going to have to use some restraint here so we don't hit each other, but you really should. You hear the little whoosh? You should be getting a whoosh on that blade any time that blade moves. And where the blade whooshes is generally where the best power for the cut is. If you listen, that whoosh will be right here. Right here. If it's up high, which that one was, that means I wasted my power here, not the blade should be right here with the best power. And you should be focusing beyond. If I'm going to hit him here, my intent should be for that part of his hip for that part of his head. An exercise that I was taught to do, everyone face a 45 that way. This is something you would do on your own at home. But hold the sword like this, just one hand. And I was told to get good with this, uh, the sickles, the comma, and the size as an exercise that I am to drop the sword and bring it back up. Now watch, I'll show you a couple times. You are to do this like this, just as an exercise to get the wrist to do what it's supposed to do with the sai, the comma or the sickle, the sword, and even the nunchucks. You, you let the weapon fall with it open like this. You let it fall and you are to bring it as close to your own body as possible. You are to bring it as close to your own body as possible. You are to bring it this way. And, and yes, you could hit each other here, but this is a good test because you have to do it and bring it between the guy next to you without hitting him. That's the way it should be done, the way Kevin just did it. Do it again, Kevin. Oh, no? There it goes. <laughs> Okay, this way. Then, reverse it. Each way. This is just an exercise. It's an exercise that I do when I loosen up before I do the cut at home. <coughs> before I work with the sword at home, I actually take it like this, let it drop, come here, bring it the other way, and you are to be close to your own body. You are to be at just barely there without touching. Just remember that if you hit yourself with this, which I can't say I haven't, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, when I pick up that real one, watch how aware I am. <laughs> weapons, I always tell people, and I mentioned in my other weapon seminars, regardless of how well you do empty hand kata, weapons make you more aware. Got that? If I take a student and he's doing empty hand kata, and he's about green belt level. And I teach him a, a sai kata, or nunchuk kata, or sword kata, or whatever. And get him working the sword and the weapon. All of his other empty hand forms always are better. And, and the reason I say that, the weapon makes him more aware during form. And then that relates to his other forms without him knowing it. It relates because when you are doing a form with a weapon, and if you get hurt, you're the one that gets hurt. So you become real attentive, especially doing the side. You drop the side, and it's your foot it's going to fall on. Early on in my training, I was overconfident with nunchucks. And I was wailing away, 
and all of a sudden one hit my elbow and chipped my elbow. My arm was out of, out of commission for six, eight weeks and it was swollen and I couldn't use my own. From that point on when I picked up weapons, I was real aware, very aware. You cannot get overconfident with weapons. I'm going to tell you just something that happened because I teach the cuts and the draws. <coughs> the cuts and the draws. I don't necessarily perform them myself uh, at, at demonstrations. I, my big thing is to blindfold myself and take uh, fruit or whatever and cut it off people. And today we need volunteers. <laughs> they all have to leave early. <laughs> but anyway, no. The reason I want to tell you, because this is a true story about awareness. When the sword gets drawn, it's in the case, it gets taken out and brought up to this position. And when it goes back in, you use this C that I have you doing. You know this, you, you're to hold it like this. You use this C as the guide for the back of your sword to go in the case. And you are to draw the sword and to get it back in your case, which in this case would just be between your belt. You are to pull, you make the hand in this position, the left hand, and by the way, in history, I can't find anywhere, and people just tell me, so if you read that somewhere, let me know, but in history, they said there were no uh, left-handed swords people. The people that were taught were taught this way, and even if you were left-handed, you learned this way, so you wound up doing it that way. Got that? And that's one of the reasons that the karate gi, we tell people, folds over from this side on everybody around the world, because it kept it kept the gi away from the sword. If the sword were coming out and got caught up on this, you were dead in a life or death situation. And the karate gi, or the kimono top that was worn, wound up with a tie over here to keep it away, and it wound up with a tie here to keep it away from that sword coming out. But you are to, if you take your hand and hold it like a, the letter C, <coughs> And then naturally you have it at your hip. You, you would hold the case if you had a, a sword case. You would hold the case. Let this see. And then what you are to do, you are to practice going like this and drawing the sword over that letter C, the back of it. The back of it, up top. Up top. And then when you get to the end, it falls into the case to go into the case. Understand that? You, you have it in your belt. The sword, when it comes out, comes to this position. When you put the sword in the case, you just simply, first of all, they do, and, and a lot of this is getting lost, but true to tradition, if you were to do swords with Orientals there, they would want to see you go like this before you put it away. They would want to see you dump it this way to, to the right. You would dump it and come back. Then it would fall back into your hand like that. Naturally lower at the case. I'm only doing it so you can see. You would be here. It would fall to here. And then you would draw like this. And into the case it would go. And you would be OK. This is the way it comes out. The dumping. Does anybody know what that dump is? Yes. You, you are to, if you simulate it, even in kata, that you killed somebody, <coughs> you are to show that you respect that sword, <coughs> and you will not put it away dirty, and you are to, to uh, throw the blood off it. There will be blood on, and they actually putting the blade away, wipe the blade wipe the back of it. They try never to touch this. They get bent out of shape if you touch that. <laughs> In fact, a lot of people that are truly nutty on swords go crazy because I cut watermelon and cantaloupes. I mean, it's just literally taking a good blade and ruining it. I ruin it. And I understand that. I have a blade which <coughs> your instructor has seen, but my wife picked it up several years ago an antique market, and it's over 750 years. It's a samurai sword, 
and the case is in shark skin. But the case is all dried up and cracked and peeled because it's 750 years old. But the thing that is amazing about that sword is the blade today is razor sharp. I mean, I really believe you could shave with that sword. I mean, it's that sharp. <laughs> That's the sharpest sword that I have seen or felt yet. And when they test a blade, now you can try this with any knife at home, but when they test a blade for sharpness, uh, Sandy, hand me my sword. <clears throat> oh, he's getting the real one. Now I'm in trouble. When they test the blade for sharpness, they use their thumbnail. They take the thumbnail, and you can hold your thumbnail. Now, you try this at home, and you drag <laughs> the blade down the thumbnail, and you can feel every dull dragging place that would need to be honed out to hone the sword sharper. I have a, a stone hone at home that you lather up, and I draw the sword like this over the hone and, 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 and sharpen the blade. When you test it, you put your thumbnail and take and go like that. Try that with a hunting knife at home, so you can't blame me. <laughs> a kitchen knife. No, because I want you to feel it. It's a weird <coughs> feeling. But the thumbnail is so sensitive that you will feel, if you're dragging a dent that is not visible to the naked eye, you'll feel it on the thumbnail or if there's a part that you were using too much for cutting things, and you were using it too much, it'll be like dull through there. You'll feel like a bup, 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 and you know it's dull, that it needs honed out until that's gone at that spot. And that's how you test it for sharpness with that. Overconfidence. And I want to mention this. I won't mention the person's name, because we are videoing this. But we're out in Ohio, and I taught a, a young lady years ago how to use a sword. And she's one of the best females that i ever seen using a sword. And she was amazing with that sword. Night and day, the kata would whiz, whiz. She could do the cuts, the draw, superb. I would have taken her to Japan and put her in a demonstration. We get out to this big karate tournament and she was real proud with this and comes up. My wife knows about it and the event hadn't started and she says, I am gonna take number one today. I am on and the sword is gonna move and we were gonna send her into the weapons competition. She says, I want you to just watch my kata one time. She goes and she does the with the sword and her thumb falls off. True, True story. Now we're talking serious awareness, you understand? She had her thumb over the blade. So that's why you cannot get a bad habit with this Vulcan. People practice with this Vulcan and get a bad <coughs> habit. And when I have people that are going to practice or teach the sword, they are to be doing it with a real sword. Too many people practice with a Vulcan and then pick up one and they, the mistake that they're making, they don't know because this won't hurt you. And that's a true story took the thumb right off. They put the thumb in a bag, took her to the hospital, they got it back on, it's in circulation, and it's good today, and we go out to Ohio, and this lady comes to one of my seminars. I always do take people over and show them her scars right around the whole thumb, because that's what happens, and that's, that's overconfidence and or practicing with the wrong weapon, the wrong piece of material. Everybody understand that now? So if you do want to do this and get better with it, you go get your own sword. I recommend a sharp one because you're not putting anybody on by using the blunt <coughs> ones. And I'm not uh, saying this actually bragging, but when I was cutting watermelons blindfolded, I made the Ripley's Believe It or Not twice because I was the only one doing it in this country truly blindfolded. Got that? They had an eye doctor from Reading come in for the one shot and take 50 cotton, they put cotton in my eye sockets, take 50 cent pieces over, and then I put the blindfold <laughs> on 
And the one doctor, I don't know why he thought I could see, but he wanted a hood yet too. And I did a hood, and I cut an apple out of Sandy Schlesman's mouth. And I cut a watermelon off Larry Tennant's chest. He's not with us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <clears throat> but, so I was certified. I do not allow <coughs> trickery in anything that is done in my, with my people. We were in, uh, uh, at a big tournament down in Miami. In fact, I think some of us in the room were there. And a man was doing a sword, and he was using a magician's blindfold. And he was getting up, going to do a sword that night. And I said, wait a second, that's not a blindfold. And I went, I told him about it. I said, that's not a blindfold. Well, he says, I don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's, it's a magician's blindfold. A magician's blindfold is black material. It's black material, and you can't see through it. But you can the other direction. And you put it on, and it's like looking at you right now. It's like I have one on now. I can see everybody. And usually those kind of goofballs give it away because they'll, they'll miss and they'll go find the guy over here or something. If they're truly blindfolded, they don't know where he is. One of the things that when I put on my blindfold and I told people, when, once I put that on, you can't move or I'm going to cut you. And I have cut some people because that question comes up. I've cut four people out of, out of hundreds of, of goes at it, though. But I wound up cutting four people. <laughs> In fact, one of them was Sandy. <laughs> Didn't I cut you? Yes. And how many stitches? Uh, four. Yes. No. Four hundred stitches. <laughs> <laughs> four stitches and, and cut the belt, double thick belt that it fell to the floor. But she moved on me. You can't move when I put this on. You say, if you move, I don't know where you're at. That's why I got a blindfold that did this, and it did, and I usually do this, so that they know that it's going to fill the eye sockets with extra material, and I can't see. That's why I do it that way. You People, when I first learned how to do that, I was told to cheat. But I never could cheat, because I wore contact lenses. And the minute I put this on, it used to push the contact lenses in my eye, and I couldn't cheat. Everybody else was cheating, and they were peeking out of the bottom of it. <laughs> and especially if you've got a nice nose like I got, you, can, you could peek out of the bottom. <laughs> but I never really could cheat. I had to learn to do it right, because I had contact lenses, and without the contact lenses, I really couldn't see right. And besides, I did it so fast, cheap when the... Some people said, were you peeking? What would it matter? I just did it. I just cut three things within two seconds or something. You don't have time to, to pee when you cut. <laughs> but that's why I did it this way, and that's why I don't, I wouldn't let you use a magician's blindfold. And a magician's blindfold, the first sign of it is they usually go to somebody in the audience and say, can you see through that? And he says, no. But then they put it on this way. They don't say, can you see through that side? You can't see through either side of this one. But that's what they do. You understand what I'm saying? That's a magician's blindfold. You go to any magic shop and buy one. And they're usually black. So that everybody's convinced they can't see through it. They usually go to somebody in the audience and say, can you see through that? And he goes, no. And he really can't. This direction. But the way they weave the material, you can see through that, that direction. That to me is phony. This guy down there, and he showed it. Because he missed one thing and he went back to re-find it. And I says, if he's truly really blindfolded, how did he know that, where that was? He went after it. So we don't use trickery. We don't, I use a real sharp sword. I've cut the belt off of people. I've cut the belt off them without injuring them, and I've cut the belt off and injured a few people. Like I said, there's about four people that went for stitches, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I use a real sharp sword. I use a real sharp sword. And, and that's the only way it can be done. Some people that go out and they try to cut watermelons, they're using the aluminum sword that's blunt, and you can hack through a watermelon. I can get you a blunt one. In fact, you can probably take that poker and hack through a watermelon. <laughs> but I actually would cut through it and learn to do the cuts with the toe, <coughs> with the toe. 
And then once you do that, you line the toe up, you put the blindfold on, and then a lot of concentration. If you take your right hand and hold it out in front of you, take your right hand, hold it out in front of you, with or without a sword, it don't matter, stare at the right hand. Stare at it, right at that hand. Give total concentration to that hand. Slowly close your eyes, and you can lower the hand, and you can still see the hand if you do it right. In other words, if you were concentrating on the hand, do you still see the hand, most of you? Some of you, you won't. You're having a hard time closing your eyes. But you, in other words, stop. That's, that's what I do when I used to do the watermelon blindfold. I stare, I stare, and I make sure the toe is in the middle of it. And then I usually use the watermelon because I have this much room for error. You have a lot of room for error. However, most of the time I still try to get it dead center. But you, you have this much room for your toe alignment to be off. That's why watermelons are best to be used, and especially for final cuts. Now, for any dangerous cuts, I do them first. And then it would be the littler thing. It would be an apple. It would be a, a cantaloupe. And I would slice it and then go for the melon, and I have a melon this big. So it's not trickery, but it is, it is a little bit because you do have room for error with the watermelon. And <clears throat> do you have a piece of fruit I can slice? In the bag. Anything. OK, good. You can try this at home, juggling. Oh, man, wow. The juice man. Whoa. <laughs> 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 Juice man. Am I on a hold? She's using the real thing this time. You want to hold it? Yeah. Let me explain something. Well, yeah, come on out here. Get on your knees. <laughs> Turn that <back. laughs> Everybody sit down a minute. <laughs> Put your hand right here like this. <laughs> you hold your hand like this, put this against your body. Then you take your other hand and support that hand, because that hand can't vibrate or move. I'm just telling you how to do this in case you want to do any of this in a demo with your school. You make sure that the person's thumb is down, because you are using a real sword that got to be that way, down. They got to curl down, and the hand has to be level. I want to show you with the wooden one first so you get the idea. I want to show you the difference between the cuts. <coughs> uh, the piece is loose, it's coming off. But I want to show you the difference. Your hand held this way, so you will know why the hand is held this way for sport versus this way for killing or cutting for real. I hold the hand this way because it stops the sword almost level. In other words, I really have a difficult time to make the sword go that way. Understand? The sword almost stops level, it stops level, it stops level. So if I place something on his head, I would have it right there. No, I would arrange you. I would adjust you. I would adjust her as to whether this was too high for my cut or too low. So then I'd want her to sit back a little bit, maybe her butt, because she's a tall girl, so that's it. I need this, the height that I know my cut is level. When I do this cut, my sword will stop level. It will stop level. But when I do this cut or hold, my sword does not stop level. It will always go to a 45, which would cut her hand off her. <laughs> I'm just telling you, this is, this is the difference in the hold. My sword will not stop level. If I take a sharp blade or a knife, and I tell people, <coughs> I was just camping with some people and I was showing them this, and we took a, a butcher knife, and I had them hold and hit their own hand. 
you will not cut the skin as long as the blade doesn't do this. Got it again? I'm going to go over it one more time. If I take a sharp blade, sharp blade, and go like this, no cut. But if I even move it that much this way, like a sawing motion, a cut. I'm sure everyone here has been cut with a piece of paper. Yes. A piece of paper. That's because you drug it across the skin. So that's why this is a sport hold, because it only allows me to do what you just see me do to my own hand, and it shows, and it allows me to hit her entire hand flat and cut the object without cutting her. Now, in the sport hole in the cut, <laughs> I have already given somebody a little cut there, never anything serious, but no more than a piece of paper would do. But that's only if this would happen just even a split second. So I have to be quick enough with that that none of this takes place. In other words, if I, she is holding something and I cut and do that, we're going to get hand and fruit. <laughs> you understand now? And do you understand why I told you that this is a sport hold? A lot of people don't know that. This is more the combat hold because this allows the blade to have the, that little cut, that slide that we need. You need, if I, wanna, if I did this to him, I might not cut a shoulder. But if I did this to him, I'm going to cut a shoulder. Like filleting fish, or I'm sure you've tried to cut a tomato, and you, you run into the skin. This is like tomato skin. And to cut tomato skin, you've got to do this or use a serrated edge blade. So it's 99% it's safe. <laughs> Do that. Show him your hand. Give him a round of someone to do that. Sandy Schleschman does that. Cut things. But what I had her do, she had to do it to her own hand first many times. Right, Sandy? Mm -hmm. Before I would allow her to do it on someone else. That's the way I was taught. When I was first taught how to slice, I had to hold an apple or a cucumber in my own hand and do the same thing. You just gotta know and trust the fact that you cannot cut the skin as long as you just do that. And then you can even do it pretty hard without cutting the person. Really hard. When I lay somebody down with a watermelon, and now you rewatch the videos of me doing it, you'll see that I go beyond that watermelon. In other words, I get into belly. I usually pick somebody to hold the watermelon that has a nice enough belly. <laughs> In other words, I don't pick some real skinny person, is what I'm saying. I wouldn't say, John, lay down, hold the watermelon, because he, might, he don't have any belly. It's like a, like a ripple board. I don't know how to damage my blade. <laughs> I try to get somebody, or like me, with a little, little belly there, and I get him to lay down, and then I have, I have give. I have give, and then I know that I'm not going to cut skin, because I'm not doing this to the skin. I cannot do that. If I did that same cut and held this sort of like this, it would start cutting over there and be right about to there on the same motion I just did. Because the blade would go beyond. It would not stop level. And then you practice with it stopping level, stopping level, stopping level, stopping level. And you practice that. And you practice the line of the toe, line of the toe, Line of the toe, line of the toe, 
line of the toe, whoop, whoop, and then you just practice it, and then you put a blindfold on to it, alone at home. And when I teach people to cut, which we can't do everybody right now, but I would have you hold something like that. Hold your sharp blade and go whomp off your own hand many times so you can feel it and feel what it does <coughs> to the person. Then I get them to do what you saw there. She was a little tall, so I had her sit back. In other words, I move that person to where I know my cut's going to be complete. I don't readjust my stance. Tall person, short person, I don't go like this to make the cut or like this because I haven't practiced for years. Shifting my stance, my stance has always been the martial arts stance and level here. So I take whoever's holding and get them to that level. And then I get it there, we're level, and the cut portion is actually easy. Now with a blindfold on is another thing because you have to have been practicing it for a long time without a blindfold before you attempt a blindfold. And then the first time you do a blindfold, you are to do a watermelon because you have this much room for error. And again, we always try to make it dead center, but I've even had some watermelon cuts where I can miss by this much on the pivot because I'm blindfolded and I'm still going to get the melon. And then I've had some uh, where I have nicked some people but sometimes they have moved. It, 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 I, I always say it's my fault because I'm the one with the blade, but it, in some cases it's their fault. Because I instruct them, I say, you cannot move when I put the blindfold on. You cannot shift even this much. Uh, Danny Pye, who taught me how to do this cut, I never cut anyone bad. Four stitches is the worst, now, that's decent enough. But uh, Danny Pye cut somebody's thumb off he put the blindfold on, and the girl holding did this. Thumb came up. And that happened at a demonstration in front of a lot of people. And he went the same cut you just see me do, and the thumb went with it. That's why I made sure the thumb was down. So I keep double checking that the thumb is down. Because people will get lazy, and especially if they've been in that position too long, and let that happen. And if that happens, you're going to cut the thumb. Anyone have any questions on that? Okay, we're going to get you up, and you're going to start. And by the way, this blade, I not only wipe, which would be the blood left, but I make sure it's clean. But then when I go home, I oil the blade. I oil it and, and rub it dry and clean it. You feel, you feel a little coat of oil on here. You feel a little bit of oil. Feel? Because I would treat this blade, right? Because I use it demo after demo after demo. And I've been using this sword. I have, would have to add it up, but it's, it's more than 20 years, this one sword. And I use the same sword all the time. I do not take a guest sword. Again, another person that I know went somewhere. They wanted him to do a demonstration. And he said, I'll cut something off somebody. I forgot my sword. Do you have one? They gave him a samurai sword. And he cut the watermelon and he injured the person. I won't do that. When I go somewhere, if I'm going to do it, I take my sword with me. You begin to get to know and feel this weapon. <coughs> if I give you my sword, you've been practicing with yours for 20 years. You still might look good with this one but you don't have the feel that I have with this blade. And then with a real samurai sword, it's amazing what you feel in this handle. It's just, it like talks to you, it tells you a story. And you can feel in that handle, what, if I tap like this, I can feel it right there. Just hold this. You feel it? Yeah. Just, just like, like electricity into the handle. So, so it's amazing. But I can feel everything that's happening out there with that blade. And if it's contacting with something, I can feel it. And when, I'm, when I cut that cucumber, I go, you only have a split second to feel it. But you feel the same thing you just felt when I did that. You feel it in the handle. So you know you're at the object. It's time to withdraw. And just like a karate punch, you move in at this speed and go back twice as fast. The blade should actually return faster than it goes in. It should slice in, return fast. Slice in, return fast. We're going to get you up and, and teach you a sword kata. 
you're going to learn most of the motion with the sword. So try to learn. You're going to have this in the kata. You're going to have this in the kata. You're going to have this in the kata. You're going to have the pivoting of the feet in the kata. You're going to have one or two long stances where you're going to go out like a stretch and drop low. Drop low, just like a leg stretch in the kata and slice at someone's legs with, with your bow. So everyone on your feet. And you're going to face the cameras. <coughs> Sandy? Sandy's going to talk you through it. And I'm going to walk around and, <coughs> and check you and give you instruction. Every other person, you, 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 take one step this way. You, you, you. So in other words, come over to here. Every other person right up here, just stagger over here a little bit so you're not really tight next to someone. <coughs> you think they'd use the short ones? At first. Uh, yeah, because we all know that the tore off. Everybody put the bokeh down and pick up a short stick of any kind. If you don't have one, maybe we can lend you one because we open up them, hold the case, and step out. They'll even pull the sword and or move it and feed it back and then do the, the draw for the sword form. Understand? So they will always take the sword and you'll see a step, sometimes just this, and come back in. And I've actually read in magazines that they're, they're, they're checking that it's free to draw, but that's wrong. That's not the real reason. That's Americans that are saying that. You know, it's, it's like our cowboys, they tied the holster down. When they pull that gun, they're going to shoot. When this sword comes out, they, they meant to use it. They worked at using this. They worked at using this. That's why some of the sword forms that you see will even go like this and move and put it back in and then come with the cut. That can, that's all right, that was loose. This and the motion that they do is someone <coughs> maybe grabbing at them, trying to stop me from getting the sword out, understand? And they would use the trap. See now why there's a motion. And or this would cut the head off. In other words, so sometimes in a kata, when they do this or this and then do that, the head's off in their thinking. In their thinking. Not always, but so a lot of the self defense was with this motion with this motion, and or they go like this. They would take this and hit a pressure point and take the head off. Sorry, but I had to do it to somebody. <laughs> I just wasn't sure who to do it to, but I had to do it to somebody. But they would use this to strike a pressure point. You understand that? You saw the result. And had I had a real sword, that would be metal, and that actually would be come in narrower. This is flat. This is too bold for the pressure point. But my sword, or Sandy's sword, if you look at the metal tip, it starts to come in. And had I hit him with the metal one, he probably would have went down. Because the metal would have been done with intensity. So when they go like this, and then draw the sword, their intent is to strike in to lift it, and when you see a sword twisted, which I didn't do to him, but when they twist, it goes in between the ribs. It hits the ribs this way, so that he goes like this, and then that takes, and the death is happening right then and there. So that's what a lot of people uh, don't understand when they see a sword motion. From the minute he moves, there is something of intent for self-defense. He doesn't have to have it out. 
the true swordsman work self-defense with the sword here, even here, the circles, to circle. You'll see a lot of forms that they will draw a circle like this. Several that I've seen pull the case out and come with a large circle. And as the case is fed back with this hand, the blade's coming with that hand. I've seen some advanced sword people actually take the case and the sword and let them come out and use the case for self-defense and the sword for strike. So, so when you see a motion, you do not... Gishin Funakoshi in one of his books said that if you know one kata and know why it's done, you don't have to know everybody's kata and why they're done. So just knowing this kata and you want to start it, you'll ever see a swordsman again on TV and, or whatever, and you'll see him move the sword, you'll now know why. If you see a circle or a long cat stance and any motion, and then the sword come out, you'll know why. At least you'll have an idea why. You'll know that he is not doing, the minute I see an American say that, I know at least he doesn't know anything about the sword. He just told me that. Not that I'm that great with the sword. I've already told you I've never really lessened uh, formally in kendo. But the minute he says that this motion is just clearing to make sure that the sword is loose to come out, I know that that's wrong. Because a man that's trained well with a sword knows that sword, knows that blade, and knows it's coming out for, for damage. And then once again, their thought was they would not get it out. Like our cowboy, you weren't to draw the gun unless you were going to kill the guy. And the same thing with the sword. It was not to come out unless you were going to kill the guy. Most of the self-defense that would be done if it were just gentle self-defense would be with this, like this, like this, like this, like that. It would be done here. If he actually pulled it out, he was to kill you. He was not to disarm you. That's why the one move that you have in the kata does butt, butt, wrist, wrist. Disarm, go for the kill. Because once again, in that day and age when they fought with a sword, if you did not kill a person, you would be seeing him again. And it might be the ball in his court the next time. So their belief was, if this was a fight, it was to the death, one died. So every time a samurai sword come out, if you read in history, someone got killed. They didn't just send you to the hospital or wound you and walk away. They would, they would do you in. And that was for that reason. Some of the katas will even have the draw, and they'll have you go like this, and that's a guy on the ground for the finish, and you'll see some very high sword katas, and you'll see them work the sword right at the ground like our bow stick, the ending. And that's because uh, if you did disarm this man and cut him, and it was a fight, then you were to kill him. It was that simple. So that's why these moves, and that's why these feeding moves <coughs> that you have. You're, you're to jump in and feed that right up into here. And yes, the lower one is right up in through the, uh, the groin area. Or down in the lower abdominal area, which anywhere down in there would, would kill the person. Okay, everybody just sit down. We're going to have Sandy do the entire kata. We'll give her separation so she has room, because we've been held back with room. And she's going to do it with a boken. Can we use this one? It doesn't have the hoosie buttons. Used to that one. Keep those sticks back. Everything back so she has plenty of room. <coughs> and then you want to do it with the real sword? Yeah. Kata, Kylie, translation, white emperor.
Yeah. But you're not used to it. I'm not used to mine. Okay. I haven't looked at mine for a while either. Mine doesn't have a Okay, release. just do it. And be careful. <laughs> Watch, watch. Watch, watch. Watch your thumb. Watch your thumb. <laughs> Kata, Pai Li, translation, White Emperor. Blocking the weapon and, and lowering down to attack the legs. That's blocking, again, the weapon, cutting the wrist, disarming, and <coughs> cutting the head. Turning and slicing, self-defense actually from behind, slicing the throat. <coughs> 